Okay, uh, thank you, Chair, and welcome everyone to our talk. I'm Zin Tao Hu, and today I'm going to present our paper, IRQD Bloat, Reducing Driver Attack Surface in Embedded Devices. This is work done together with my advisor, Brandon Delangavit. So, nowadays, many embedded devices often come with many extra hardware features, which is a good thing for us customers because it means we have more choices. But on the other hand, the driver of all those extra hardware devices could be very buggy and full of vulnerabilities, and it might uh, compromise the security of our whole system. So, for example, in this Cisco Milwaukee Wi-Fi router, it also comes with a fully functioning Bluetooth stack, which might be useful for some large organizations to locate or manage their devices. But for individual users like us, we might never want to use this feature at all. And even worse, it might bring along all the bugs related to the Bluetooth stack, which could potentially turn all our routers into some hacker's Bitcoin bot. So, of course, for us end users, we'd want to disable all those hardware features that we are never going to use, or sometimes we are not even aware of, so that we can reduce the attack surface and make our system more secure. However, things could be difficult. Vendor support could be very inflexible in regards to the functionality changes in the firmware. And open source firmware could be uh, highly customizable, but some of the hardware spec might not be open to the public. So basically, you're running it on, on your own risk. So it seems the best option would be to grab an official firmware and patch it by yourself. But then again, it's not something for everyone. It's highly technical, and it requires a huge amount of time just to reverse engineer the firmware. So now back to our paper. What we were trying to achieve here is to automate this highly technical process so that we can automatically reverse engineer the binary code that is responsible to all those hardware features. And then we can patch them out in the firmware. But now the question is, what kind of code should we be looking for? to either reverse engineer or binary patching. Well, since our paper is called IRQ Bloat, apparently we are targeting IRQ handlers or interrupt handlers. Uh, we have a couple of reasons. First of all, interrupts are widely supported by almost all the CPUs or microcontrollers. And more importantly, they all work in a very similar way. Uh, let's take a look at this diagram for a very quick example. Assuming that I'm sending a few keystrokes through the serial port, and it's going to create an I.O. event in the serial device, the signal is going to propagate to the interrupt controller, which will in turn raise an IRQ exception in the CPU. And then the CPU would jump to an exception entry point and it's where it can read the hardware IRQ number from the interrupt controller. And based on that, it can dispatch to the specific device interrupt handler which in this case is going to be the serial device interrupt handler, which will communicate directly with the serial device and eventually complete the I.O. event. So here comes our second reason that we chose interrupt handler, is that they are all device specific, which means as long as we can disable an interrupt handler, we can prevent all the I.O. events coming through that hardware device, and therefore we can disable its functionality from the perspective of a user. And Moreover, uh, targeting IRQ handlers would make our binary patching easier because all we have to do is to patch a direct return so that we can bypass all the communications between the operating system and the hardware device. There has been other works related to the kernel code debloating based on kernel configs or dead code removal, but they're all Linux specific and they require source code or object files during the process of compilation. Um, so now we have to design such a system that can automatically reverse engineer all those interrupt handlers. But at the same time, we also face a few challenges related to the binary analysis. One of the challenges we face is the diversity of different operating systems that may, they might have different software design. Uh, so in our binary analysis, we have to accommodate all those differences across all the different operating systems. And Furthermore, uh, even though some of the operating systems might share similar software design, we might still run into trouble when trying to reverse engineer the interrupt handlers. Because, uh, for example, many interrupt handlers are actually registered dynamically during the runtime. 
So it would be very difficult for static analysis to find out all those interrupt parameters. So instead, in our solution, we use dynamic analysis that is based on the snapshot taken directly from the hardware device. And then we'd use a coverage-guided fuzzing and trace analysis to find out all those interrupt handlers. Uh, here, here we show an example of pseudocode that how, in general, an operating system would handle an incoming interrupt. Um, we can see that it would first try to read the IRQ number from the interrupt controller and then dispatch to the correct interrupt handler. So now our idea here is that we can simulate this interrupt controller device and use fuzzing to enumerate all the possible IRQ numbers so that we can collect many different traces that is handling different IRQs. Since we know that all those traces would start from a common exception entry point, we can just simply do a trace diff and find out all those divergence points, and which would be the interrupt handlers we were trying to look for. Here's a more concrete example for like two traces that is handling two different IRQs. We can see that both of the traces uh, share a fair amount of code starting from the entry point, and eventually they diverge right after the dispatching point. And if we look closer at the divergence point here, we can immediately spot that these two functions that is being dispatched are exactly the two IRQ handlers corresponds to each of the traces. Um, as we also mentioned that we use fuzzing to uh, enumerate IRQ numbers and help us explore interrupt handling code. Um, however, we cannot simply just grab a random fuzzer off the shelf and start fuzzing because there are many different hardware designs that might have different protocols to communicate with the software. So uh, more specifically for interrupt controllers, the presentation of the IRQ number could also be different. So uh, in our fuzzing, we have to design such a dictionary that contains all the possible IRQ encodings coming through the hardware. And besides, sometimes other free referrals on the same system could also get in the way when we were doing the fuzzing. Uh, for example, like uh, there are many memory mapped I.O. access from the peripherals might require software validations. So during the fuzzing, we have to design several extra strategies to get around all those checks in the driver code. Uh, here's how IRQ fuzzing works. First, we take a snapshot from the target device uh, with its memory dump and CPU registers. And we load it up in our emulator, which is Panda in our case so that we can continue the execution and raise an IRQ exception so that we can start exploring the interrupt handling code. Uh, to simulate the hardware input, we use a sequence of dictionary values, which contains several patterns, such as integers, uh, sliding window, bitmax, and several constant patterns, such as zero or negative one, et cetera. And, and we would feed these values one after another during the execution so that um, in the end, we can see whether we've gained any new coverage through this execution, so that we can decide whether we want to keep this trace or dis simply discard this trace. Um, but for either way, we'd want to continue fuzzing uh, and start another round of fuzzing by raising another IRQ exception and feed it with another sequence of dictionary inputs until like uh, until we've collected enough traces which would cover all the register interrupt handlers. Uh, here's the workflow of IRQ dblock. As we've already covered some part of it, that we take a snapshot and migrate the embedded system up to our analyzing platform so that we can collect traces that is related to the IRQ handling code. <coughs> and uh, then we can do a trace diff analysis to find out all those divergence points and also the interrupt handler addresses. And in the final step, we uh, find a match in the binary firmware corresponding to all those interrupt handlers so that we can patch them out and disable the hardware feature. Um, for the implementation, um, here we show an outline of uh, our implementation details. Uh, since there are very strict time limits here. We probably won't be able to uh, went through every single details we've done here. Um, so just in case that anyone's interested, please check out our paper or simply grab us after the talk. 
Um, one thing to note here is that our implementation in the trace diff analysis is uh, based on the algorithm that is introduced in the paper execution indexing and differential slicing. On top of that, we also find a few cases that the original algorithm didn't handle very well, which might introduce some of the false, posit false negatives. Uh, so uh, we have to make some changes and uh, improvements so that the algorithm could accommodate our situations better. Um, now, for our evaluation, uh, we've selected a variety of hardware devices, uh, which includes several common dev boards, uh, including Raspberry Pi, uh, BeagleBone, and Saber Lite. Uh, we also included two devices that has already been uh, implemented in Kimio, uh, which are uh, Samsung Neuri board and A-Speed Romulus board. Uh, we also included this WRT54GL as an example of a MIPS device since all the other hardware devices are ARM arch architecture. And finally, uh, we also included this Steam Link device as a real world example that don't have a JTAG interface. Um, for the operating systems, we also included four different operating systems in our evaluation set, where uh, we have Linux and FreeBSD as examples for generic and open source operating system. And also we have VxWorks and RISC OS as examples for uh, real-time OS. So uh, now one thing that people would concern most is how accurate our automated reverse engineering is. So here we show that um, we can uncover uh, almost all the IRQ handlers that is registered in each of the systems that we evaluated. And we also show that uh, we can achieve that with very low uh, false negatives and also very few false positives. Um, one of the reasons for the false negatives is that some of the IRQ handlers could already be disabled by the operating system by the time we took the snapshot. So uh, there is no chance that we can still reach these IRQ handlers during the fuzzing. But then again, um, even though in the original embedded system, these IRQ handlers were, won't be functioning anymore, so uh, we believe that it is fine to have those false negatives here. Also for the false positives, uh, since the number of false positives is also very low, we believe that these false positives won't cause any trouble in our further evaluation related to the binary patching or the actual hardware function removal. Because uh, we can simply just try to patch out each single one of them and check whether the uh, expected hardware feature has been disabled or not, and therefore we can simply eliminate all those false positives. Um, another thing that people might concern is how much time it's gonna take for us to uncover all those interrupt handlers. So here we show that, um, here we show the coverage of uh, all the IRQ handlers during the fuzzing run versus the time we spend on the fuzzing. Um, here we show that uh, we can uncover like all the, almost all the um, IRQ handlers that is registered for most of the systems set in our evaluation set, except one of the case, Saberlite Linux, which might take over uh, 24 hours to uncover the last one IRQ handler. Um, also to note that the same system, uh, Saberlite Linux, which won't be able to reach 100% coverage, which is exactly because of the false negatives we just mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, in the end, we want to see how effective we can reduce the attack surface. Uh, so uh, in this evaluation, we chose this target uh, Steam Link device as our evaluation target. Um, which is a streaming device that uh, lets, uh, lets the user to, uh, which is a streaming device that lets the user to play all their PC games on a big screen. And unfortunately, its hardware device has been discontinued around four years ago. So at this moment, there is no uh, guarantee that at which point Valve is gonna drop its software update. So uh, in this evaluation, we try to disable every single one of the interrupt handlers that is, exist in this system and see how many bugs we can prevent uh, in each of the corresponding subsystems. And um, 
So we, we collected all the Linux kernel CVEs for the past five years. Uh, and among them, uh, we ended up like 157 of them in total, which are remotely exploitable CVEs. And here we show that by turning off each single one of the interrupt handlers, we can uh, prevent uh, in total 31 CVEs that is in the USB subsystem. And we can also prevent seven CVEs related to the Bluetooth device and also six related to the Wi-Fi device, which ended up 44 in total. Of course, you can like prevent all the 44 CVEs uh, that is uh, possibly exist in the system by turning off all the interrupt handlers. But then again, it would leave your device completely unusable. So in the end, um, in conclusion, we've su successfully enumerated and find out all the IRQ handlers in our evaluation. And we also show that we are effective in attack surface reduction and furthermore, we also propose this automated reverse engineering technique, which hopefully could be useful for further emulation or rehosting research. And also, our code is open source. Feel free to check out. All right, any questions? If you have questions, please come to the microphone. Okay, hello. Shuqi Anzhao from the Ohio State University. Very great talk. So. You can't hear me? Okay. So I have a very quick question about this. It's, it's about the firmware signature that you really use in modern like embedded systems. So if you don't sign your firmware, then perhaps it, a lot of people can just deploy malicious firmware. But in your method, you patch the firmware so you create a new one. And that one is not signed by the vendor. So how do you compare the trade-off between the a signed firmware model that does not allow your way to, to execute or to, to allow people to just patch the firmware randomly. Yeah, right, you are absolutely right. Like, this is also one of our limitations that we don't handle like signed firmware because like, some of those uh, signed firmware checks are actually exist in the bootloader or like, even lower, lower level. So basically, most of the user won't have uh, the interface or access to change all those uh, firmware, signed firmware checks. Um, so basically in our uh, uh, attack, attack, uh, attack model, we, we simply uh, assume that all those devices we can have access to don't have like uh, either signed firmware or encrypted firmware, et cetera. Okay, I see, thank you. Thanks. So a follow up question I have is, uh, do you have any idea like how you could extend this when you don't have access to the firmware or when you can get the firmware out of the device? Uh, yes, actually uh, in our implementation we have uh, three ways. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the ways is we can use JTAG to uh, uh, dump the memory from the embedded device. And uh, if it's also the case, we can simply just refresh the memory back to the embedded device and continue the execution. And also we have other methods like uh, injecting code into the operating system. Like in one of the, our case, we use a Linux kernel module to dump the memory from the embedded system. And uh, I would assume that we can simply use the same method to flash it back or flash back the changes we made in the memory and back to the embedded system and continue the execution in case we don't have access to firmware. So was there any case you encountered that you couldn't get the firmware out? Uh, uh, no, actually all our uh, evaluations, we, have, we all have those uh, firmware binary, which could basically download it from some of the vendor websites. But I, I think uh, like uh, those, like the re re refresh the memory should also work because it's just memory patching the Invest system. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, cool. Thanks.